I'm a freelance journalist and author. I focus mostly on the intersections of incarceration, gender, and resistance, or in shorthand, women in prison, mostly. Um, I write for various news outlets, mostly online. I've also written a couple of books like Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women. I'm finishing up another book about ways in which popular alternatives to incarceration, such as electronic monitoring, uh, forever probation or lengthy periods of probation are actually ways to expand the prison system into our homes and communities. So I actually had no intention of writing a book when I first started. It actually, uh, Resistance Behind Bars actually came out of a question that I had, which was what are women in prison doing to organize and resist their conditions of confinement? So I had read a lot about the uprisings and the organizing that had happened in men's prisons across the country from the 1970s to present day, work strikes, hunger strikes, riots, lawsuits, and I wasn't seeing any correlating mm -hmm. information or events happening in women's prisons. So I asked myself, well, what are women doing? What are their concerns uh, when, they're, when they go to prison? And I started researching and I started reaching out to various women in prison and I asked them, what are your concerns? What are your priorities? What are you doing to address these concerns and priorities? What help have you received? What help have you not received? And their answers were actually quite startling. Uh, even though the majority of people in men's prisons and in women's prisons are parents, oftentimes because of the way we gender parenting, when a father goes to prison, oftentimes he has somebody, usually a female, family member take care of his children. So it could be his wife, his ex-wife, his girlfriend, his mother, his sister, his cousin, but usually he can be pretty sure his children won't end up in the foster care system. When a mother goes to prison, she's often the single head of household or her partner is arrested alongside of her. Um, her family may not be that safe. Over half of women in prison report having experienced abuse from those closest to them. So they might not be, feel that their children are safe with their family members that are outside, and their children are five times more likely to go to the foster care system than children of incarcerated fathers. So if you think about ties to family and trying to maintain family connections, the types of organizing that women are doing look very different than what men are doing. So it might be that women educate themselves about the law, that they plant themselves in the prison's law library. So every prison, or nearly every prison has a library a law library where people can go and they can research the law and they can try to file their legal petitions. And oftentimes women who have been through the process or who understand more about law or have a better understanding of how to navigate this kind of legal language will sit in the law library and help other mothers be able to navigate, like I got this petition, I don't understand what this means or how do I get the social worker to bring my child to see me in the prison. In, for instance, in New York State, social workers are supposed to bring children to visit their parents in the prison. Oftentimes they don't want to do this because going to a prison is onerous, it is time consuming, you are often treated like garbage by the officers, um, it mm -hmm. can take up the whole day. So why would anybody want to do this if they can get out of doing this? But trying to organize around maintaining those parental connections and those family ties often looks different than what men are doing. So even though women, people in women's prisons, understanding that there are trans women in men's prisons and people who don't identify as women in women's prisons, but women's prisons make up 10% of the prison population. As I've just talked about, mm -hmm. their struggles and their conditions and their concerns are different. And if you don't address those concerns, then those continue to happen. So even though women make only make up only 10% of the prison population. If you're not addressing pathways to prison that are specifically gender specific, like uh, domestic violence and family violence as a pathway into the criminal justice system, looking at the consequences of tearing apart families as a result of mass incarceration, then um, looking at the fact that there is a gender wage gap and that wage gap is even greater for women of color than it is for white women and looking at that so there is not an economic or uh, financial safety net for a lot of women to begin with and then when they come out of prison and they have a felony record they're unable to access employment they're unable to access uh, certain economic safety nets 
then you end up with a revolving door. And we've seen this in several states where even though the rate, like Texas and Indiana, where the rate of men's incarceration has gone down, the rate of women's incarceration has gone up because there's not a way of looking at this more holistically. So I think that having the ability to tell your story and to know that people will listen to it and read it and take it seriously is hugely important for everybody. But then when you consider the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, at least half of women behind bars reported being abused before their arrest. We can assume that the numbers are much higher because we know that people tend to under-report abuse and victimization. So if you imagine growing up in an environment where you've always been told that your words don't matter, your actions don't matter, no matter what you say, nobody will believe you, nobody will care, to suddenly have a forum and encouragement to express yourself is huge. So, in, and it combats everything that people have been told again and again and again, both by the people who have abused them before they ended up being arrested and going to prison, and throughout their whole legal process where you're arrested and the police don't believe you. Mm -hmm. You go to court and the prosecutors don't believe you. Perhaps your attorney doesn't really believe you or doesn't have time to dive into this. It looks like the judge doesn't believe you. It looks like the jury doesn't believe you. So to have all of that reinforced again and again and again, to have people say your words don't matter, we don't care, we think you're lying, we don't believe you, just be quiet, just do this, just do that. To have somebody say, let's hear what your story is. You know, let's mm -hmm. figure out a way to tell your story. And let's also figure out a way to tell your story so that you can communicate it clearly. So instead of saying it was terrible, let's talk about what it was. What was it? Can you describe terrible? You know, can you give us more? And so it's also a way of helping them be able to communicate these experiences, both the good and the bad um, in their lives, in a way that I think resonates with other people and hopefully allows them to share their stories and create connections.